Paul and I got us uh, some kind of lifetime achievement award from the Producers Guild, and it was very, it was, it was sweet and and all to get it. But it, my father cast a big shadow, and I spent my life subconsciously running from that shadow, be, trying to be my own person. And as I said earlier, going into Danny Town's productions, it was in the back of my head. This is great. We're going to run it, but it's Danny Town's productions, Tony. I mean, you're going right into the, right into it. Uh, so uh, it was time to go and uh, do our own thing. And, uh, but, you know, as I said in this uh, Producers Guild uh, acceptance speech, I spent my entire life running from a shadow, but, and I, but I now gladly walk in his footsteps. I mean, everything I've done has been uh, kind of classic in the sense of walking in his footsteps. Uh, finding a partner like Paul Witt, who became my brother and dear friend, uh, just like he and Sheldon became very, very dear friends uh, and a brother to each other, brothers to each other. So, uh, and, and then, you know, there was a period of time when Paul and I had six shows on the air. And we had six shows on the air on the same lot, the Desilu Coenga lot, where my father and Sheldon had six shows on the air, or five shows, or seven shows, whatever they had going at the time. I mean, every show was their show on the lot, except for, I think, the new Lucy show or something. And uh, later on, that, that lot on Coenga became Renmar uh, Studios. And Paul and I literally had all those shows on the air on this lot where my father and Sheldon had that. I look around, and you, you'd go in the center, of the, because it was a small lot, this little area, and you look around, and I remember being this tall and this tall and this tall and being the kid there, delivering mail there, and now I own the place. You know, I mean, all these shows, every, every sign on a soundstage had our production company name on it with one of our shows. And I remember one time, uh, uh, was standing literally in the middle of that lot in this, in this area where the office buildings and, and sound stages are in the top part of the lot. And people were coming at us left and right for various reasons, whether it be a wardrobe for Beauty and the Beast or something for Blossom or something for Golden Girls. That people were coming for all around, because we were just standing in the middle of the lot, and the, and the traffic of people were all our people. So they were constantly stopping. And I had this really odd image of being smaller and looking at my father's belt. Uh, it, was, it was truly deja vu. I mean, my father had a belt that had a little watch on it and you click it and the watch flipped open. And during, or he had it for a period of time, and during that time he had that watch, that belt with a watch. And I remember, that, I remember just standing there visualizing that watch, and it was like, I had, I've been here. I've been here with two men standing here being the center of attention for a lot of different people coming up with a lot of different questions. So it was just very, very, I mean, you know, go figure, of course, you know, why? You know, what else do you think was going to happen with your life? I mean, extremely, extremely lucky, you know, a lot, of, a lot of hard work and a lot of luck went into it, but it was, you know, it was like predestined that, okay, I see, I'm walking the same thing. So it was very, it was very, very interesting. I once told my father, I said, uh, this has become a, a story in Hollywood, but it's actually a very true story. Uh, later on, uh, Bill Persky and Sam Denoff worked for Paul and I, and they created that girl. And they worked on, for my father on, uh, on Dick Van Dyke. And they, when they were working for us on this same lot, they said, you know, we gotta have a TNL reunion, Thomas and Leonard reunion, and bring back all the guys, Gary Marshall, Jerry Belson, all these guys, all the writers, Carl Reiner, all these great writers and actors, uh, Dick Van Dyke, Mary Tyler Moore, uh, uh, all these people, and Andy Griffith and uh, have a TNL reunion. And so we said, okay, let's do it. And I told this story on my father, which is a true story. Because of the, and, and because of the fact that we were on Desi, the Desi Lula uh, and having these experiences that I just discussed, I mean, it was clear I was living a good chunk of my father's life as he had lived in the past. Coincidentally and bizarrely, my wife at the time had found a house in Beverly Hills for us to live in on the 700 block of Elm Drive. I ended up, I grew up on the 600 block of Elm Drive. So now I'm raising my family one block up on the same street. It's like, you're kidding me, right? And 
One day I'm driving to work, taking the same route my father took. And I was driving, holding the wheel. And I looked down and it looked like my father's hands. And I had remembered, remembered at that moment being in the passenger seat on one of those days I was talking about, like on a Catholic holiday or something where I could go to work with him, and looking over at his hands on the wheel. And I looked down and there they were over his hands, you know, but they're mine now. And then I realized that I'm taking the same, not only am I working in the same studio, I'm taking the same route. I'm going to, uh, you know, to down to Elevado to, to Down Palm and to Melrose and Melrose, all the way to, uh, to Cahuenga and make a left in Cahuenga and I'm there. I mean, that was uh, that thing. And, I, and so I told him this story. I was saying how I was in the car and I'm looking down at your hands and it's my hands and they're your hands and, and I'm on the same road driving on Melrose, going to the same studio and I come home, I take the same route back, I drive on to Elm Drive. I said, it's just, you know, and I realize now who you are. I didn't know who you were. You know, like, I got, I didn't get, I got his temperament and not really his personality, you know. I mean, I, he'd come home with all of his stuff, you know. And now I knew who that guy was, who came in with all the stuff because it's the same stuff I'm going through. So I started to look at him differently. The guy that, you know, the first few minutes was a little crazier as he settled down later on in the night and all of that, just that whole thing, the, the man that came through the door. And I said, I just, you know, I, I, I get you more now, Dad, oddly, retrospectively, having now lived your life and who, the, who you were that came to that door after driving on Melrose. And he looked at me and in all serious said, I took Willoughby, which is another way to get to the studio. I said, you are kidding me, right? This is not about driving directions. <laughs> I am having like an epiphany here. I am understanding who you are as a man at this moment. This is like that Brother John drummer thing from years ago, men are men circle. I said, I'm really getting this now, you know, who you are and I love you even more for it and you're telling me that it's the wrong direction? I took the wrong street and we have laughed, we laughed about it for years and years and years. Anyway, I told that story and, and it became a shorthand. When anybody missed the point, uh, in our lives after that, my father and I, or Paul Witt and I would always say, he took Willoughby.